ruby red, the color of blood, the color of love. It was the first stone created in a laboratory. And it was the first stone that jewelers could not distinguish from a natural one. And it all happened in 1897, when Auguste Vernil visited a friend of his who was the owner of a jewelry shop. Good evening, Victor. Good evening, Monsieur Vernil. What brings you here? Let me show you. Pardon me, but... Oh, what a beautiful rhinestone. This is a real ruby. Real? So big? That can't be, Monsieur Vernil. Check it yourself. The jeweler checked it using all available methods and immediately realized why he was holding in his hands. This is the most magnificent Indian ruby that I have ever seen. Indian? Well, yes, there is no other deposit of rubies with such size and purity in the world. I congratulate you, Monsieur Vernil. This is the greatest thing I have ever seen in my life. Auguste, I certainly congratulate you. It is priceless. Priceless. Yes, it was a victory. After an unsuccessful press conference, Vernil proved, with the help of experiments, that the rubies created in his laboratory were indistinguishable from natural ones, or almost indistinguishable. So what kind of technology did he use? The technology was later named after him, the Vernil process. So a ruby consists mainly of aluminum oxide, Al2O3. That's what the scientist was able to synthesize. In a special furnace, he melted a mixture of oxides in the heat of a hydrogen-oxygen flame. The resulting dewdrops begin to settle on a previously prepared tiny ruby, the seed crystal, and they formed a clear ruby structure. The single crystal, or bull, slowly became larger, and as the new droplets kept on settling on it, the result was an elongated gem with a conical shape. Gorgeous, clean, Big, but unnatural. But if you don't know its origin, who cares? But some people did care. And still care. Good evening. Hello. You've come to a jewelry store to buy a ring. You see two rings. The stones that are inserted in them look the same. Only the price differs. One ring costs $900. The other ring costs $2,000. You trust the jeweler. Which one do you choose? Hmm, that's hard. I don't know. Probably this one. And why? Well, it's cheaper. Well, the one that's cheaper. This one. Why? Because they are the same. Why pay more? Well, of course I will choose the cheaper one. The cheaper one? Exactly. Next, the seller comes to you and says that this stone is synthetic. But this one is natural. Synthetic means that this stone was simply manufactured in a laboratory. And here it is, a natural stone. This means that it was extracted from the earth, processed, and inserted into the ring. Well, i choose the natural one, then. The natural one, I guess. The natural stone, yes. Well, it will be more valuable for me personally. The seller offers you a super sell of the day. You can buy this ring for the same price. It has a bigger stone and looks much better, but... Synthetic gemstone. No, I'll choose the natural one anyway. I would still buy the natural stone. I mean, I am more interested in the quality. The quality is identical. How so? This one is artificial and this one is natural. The natural stone for sure. I like its design better. That's who cared. People did not want to buy synthetic stones. Yes, they are identical to natural ones. Yes, they had the same physical properties and the same crystal lattice. Yes, they were cheaper, but no. No. Подарил мне камень на долгую память. Без изысков в нем отражается свет. Пробую себя с той вещицей представить. Скажу ему нет, нет, нет. Подарил мне камень на долгую память. Без изысков в нем отражается свет. How the general public did not immediately find out that gemstones could be artificially produced. 
27, so Vernil did his job. Vernil can retire. But other inventors and businessmen came to replace him, and it all started there. Today, it is known for certain that Peter Carl Fabergé used synthetic stones for some of his spherical productions. The ruby brooches, earrings, and rings in the Soviet Union were mostly of non-natural origin. It was not a secret. They wrote corundrum instead of ruby on the tag, but they didn't advertise it too much. Some people would have been shocked to find that their precious stones were actually synthesized. And as for pearls in the 19th century, they started to be widely produced in China and Japan. A small grain of sand was placed in a clamshell where it became covered with rainbow layers. It's hard to find naturally obtained pearls on the market nowadays, but there's more to it than just that. Today, you can make almost any precious or semi-precious stone in a laboratory. In addition to the vernil process, which is suitable for the production of rubies and sapphires, the Chokrowski method is widely practiced. With its help, rubies, sapphires, and alexandrites are produced. Emeralds are created by using the flux and hydrothermal methods. Malachite and opal are grown using the synthesis of low-temperature aqueous solutions. And as for artificial diamonds, three techniques have been discovered. The high-pressure method, the detonation method, and the high-temperature and pressure method. So, let's imagine we have a precious gem and a synthesized gem produced in a lab. Do they differ in their chemical properties or their physical properties? We can assume so because the synthetic one will have better color and there will be fewer impurities. But the crystal structure, its chemical composition, physical properties. Of course, people can grow exact replicas in the laboratory and their composition and structure and properties are all exactly the same. Can normal people who are not professionals spot the difference between a synthesized gemstone and a naturally mined one? We can't determine this at home, we can't do it at the store, and this can't even be determined by a salesperson in a jewelry store. Even a jeweler can't tell. Only gemologists know how they can be distinguished. But synthesized gemstones aren't the only way to make jewelry more affordable. There have been many inventors and craftsmen who have managed this feat, all for the sake of gemstones, for the sake of a sparkle, for the sake of love. Here is an interesting story from classical literature about how a new method to create precious stones was invented. We'll try to be as accurate as possible in the telling of the story. So, it all took place at the end of the 18th century. The story about how smoky topaz turned into yellow topaz. Well, first of all, smoky topaz didn't turn into yellow topaz. It was a moran or a smoky quartz, but that turned into citron. But of course, that's not important. In the days of Catherine II, the Empress of Russia, smoky quartz fell out of fashion. So the Empress notified the manager of the oldest lapidary factory, Yakov Kolkovin, about her desire to arrange for a steady supply of golden yellow gemstones to St. Petersburg. Where am I going to find so many gemstones? Do I have to go all the way to Saxony to get them? Catherine II died in the year of 1796. Kolkovan didn't begin running the lapidary factory until 22 years later. What are you talking about? Oh well, this task was set before him. He had to find stones with a golden hue and quickly. Initially, he only had smoky ones, dark ones. But then a deacon came to him and said, I heard about your unfortunate situation and here's what I can offer. You give me smoky topaz, and I'll bring you yellow topaz the next day. I have a miraculous painting of Mother Mary. Not only can it change the color of precious stones, but it can also absolve any sinner of their sins. What do you say? Think it over. You won't regret it. No, not topaz, but quartz. These are completely different stones. Their price, their appearance. Okay, okay, okay. So Kokova agreed and gave the deacon a sample of smoky topaz. Whoops. I mean, 
quartz. And sure enough, the next day he brought it back, but with a golden hue. And he said, If you so desire, I can continue to do this. But you will have to pay me for each stone. And so the process went on. Smoked quartz was brought to Kokovin's factory. He would give it to the deacon, and in return, he would get yellow quartz, which led to the price of yellow quartz doubling during that period. Well, not doubling, but they just become one and a half times more expensive. But Kokovin doesn't believe in the story about the miraculous image of Mary, so he finds out that the deacon's wife is clumsy. She was making a pie the other day, and she accidentally dropped her smoky quartz pendant in it. But then they cut the pie open. They found a yellow stone instead. The temperature of baking bread is 430 to 480 degrees, and quartz changes its color only if heated to 930 degrees. This process can't occur while baking bread, pies, rolls, cakes, or even gingerbread. Okay, that's not the point. And so, a method for refining precious stones using heat was discovered in Russia. And this method is still popular today. People have known how to use extreme heat to increase the value of gems for many thousands of years. And in nature, this happens often due to exposure to direct sunlight. For example, this is not a real story. It's fake. This story, of course, never happened. But as for the price and the quality of these precious stones, gemstones are only bright, shiny, and clear in the movies. But in real life, most of them don't look so pretty. But this can be fixed, and this process is called treatment. A treatment includes any impact on the precious stone, except cutting and polishing. So it includes dyeing, bleaching, oiling, treating with epoxy resin, diffusing, heating, irradiation, gamma, beta neutron, and a myriad of other processes. But of course, everything must be officially documented in the report supplied alongside the precious stone. Natural stones are denoted by the letter N. Stones refined by traditional, historically established methods, the methods of filling cracks, radiation, Heating are marked with the letter E. If the method is unusual or rare, the stone must have the letter T. And all the processes used must be detailed. Well, now we have precious, semi-precious, and fake stones been presented to you in a slightly different way. God knows how many things have been done to precious stones to improve their appearance. Sometimes they might even be of completely unnatural origin. So what can we do? How can we spot an imitation? No one can identify the origin of a gemstone without special equipment. We need specialists and professional tools. Thankfully, there are such people. They are called gemologists. Yes, they are called gemologists. Stop it. This is not the original song. Come on. A gemological laboratory is the place where your gems will be sent for analysis so you may learn the complete truth about your gems. A natural or lab-created ruby, treated sapphire with or without color saturation, an emerald process with an oil that hides cracks and defects, or a natural one left exactly as it was extracted from the earth. Diamonds, a girl's best friend, irradiated, which gives a blue, pink, or green hue. And there are assembled gemstones, that is, stones made up of smaller gems. They might be glued so strongly that even under a microscope you can't see the seam. The market for precious stones is huge and diverse. And there have been many innovators along the way. Who usually comes to the laboratory to have gemstones tested? More often than not, it's jewelers who have already purchased and polished a gemstone. So they can come to the laboratory to persuade the buyers that the gem is natural and it wasn't synthetically produced. Well, besides jewelers, who else? Well, it might be the dealers who deliver gemstones. They can buy a sample gem from the supplier if they want to check if they're fake or not. What makes up your expertise? 
First, when precious stones and jewelry are received, they are described and verified at the door. Many things can be identified immediately. Then comes a more detailed analysis, including spectroscopy, microscopic examination, and so on. By the way, all methods include physical impact on the jewels. Afterwards, a jewel report is written which states if the stone is natural or lab-created, processed or unprocessed, and if it was treated, it lists all the techniques used. Well, here are some jewels belonging to my family and friends. There's a certain amount of precious stones here. Can you take them to your laboratory and test them? Yes, we can do just that. We can take them and conduct an analysis. We will test each stone. If you take that much jewelry, how long will it take for you to make a report on them? The testing itself takes two working days. Issuing the report takes a little longer. I mean, it'll take about four days in total, I'd say. Four days later, we are back here at the gemological lab, and what did the examination determine? We have reached a conclusion about the stones in your jewelry. They can be divided into roughly three groups. The first group is synthetically grown stones, as they are called, as well as glass, cubic zirconia, synthetic rubies, and so on. There is a big variety. The second group is natural stones but they were treated. So these stones were exposed to some kind of treatment? Right. After they were cut and polished, they might have been heated or filled with an epoxy resin or plastics. Emeralds, for example, are usually filled with certain substances. And finally, we have natural stones that haven't been treated. They have been polished and then inserted into the jewelry. Here we have diamonds, garnet, tourmaline, amethyst, malachite, chalcedony, and natural quartz. There are many different kinds of stones here. A couple of details for our better understanding. The sapphires in the earrings turned out to be synthetic. The ruby in the ring is not natural either. Absolutely all the emeralds in all the jewelry have traces of oil treatment. The amber was treated with high temperatures and pressure. The smoky quartz was lab produced the dark diamonds were irradiated to produce their unusual color. And the red stone in the brooch turned out to be glass. Hmm. Well, what can I do? Nothing. Precious stones have always been used to indicate a person's social status, and the market will respond to consumer demands with different propositions. Nothing depends on the buyer. The only thing we need to care about is how to avoid being deceived or, well, we might not bother at all. If you have already given a gemstone to your beloved, then everything will be beautiful, like it says in the song. Look at them. Girls, come on! Gemologists, gemologists, hmm. Girls, whose legs? Who's stumbling? No! Sing about real gemstones? Precious ones! Let me 